Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday morning, another online seminar. Um, as usual, we will be taking questions via the chat box, so don't forget to use that during the session, and then Lachlan will answer these at the end for you. Um, we are joined by Lachlan Steer this morning, who will be talking to us about innovation. Lachlan's a senior associate at Silver Shannon Dash. Um, and uh, he deals a lot with uh, with all sorts of construction, but he's also very interested in renewable energy. And a lot of his uh, information, his vlogs, his talking heads, his blogs, and his articles are on the website. So if you get a chance, do check those out. Um, in the meantime, Lachlan, I shall hand over to you. Uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Julie. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's uh, lecture on novation. And welcome back to anyone, of course, who's been to one of these before with me. As you'll see, the quarantine beard is coming along and I have another jolly shirt on uh, to mark the occasion. So uh, today we'll be discussing novation uh, and uh, sort of an innocuous topic, but one that's very important and um, very uh, important to get right as well. Something that often gets overlooked. So a bit about me. Uh, I started my professional life uh, on the client side, uh, doing rail and infrastructure projects, um, then moved over into the law, trained at a large city firm, and I've been at Silver Shemmings Ash now for coming up to four years. Um, advise a variety of clients, uh, as it says here, across the board, architects, employers, subcontractors, contractors, uh, and a variety of disputes and non contentious work uh, as well. So what will be on the agenda today? Well, we'll be discussing the basic principles of novation. We'll be looking at novation uh, versus assignment, um, novation by conduct, novation of part, uh, rare but worth knowing about, uh, failure to complete a novation agreement, Repudiation, we breached innovation and some dispute resolution options. Uh, we'll also be looking at, as part of this, uh, what you'd want to see in the relevant construction documents in relation to innovation, and also um, what you would look for in the innovation agreements, what should be there, and depending on who you are, whether you're the consultant, whether you're a contractor or an employer, um, the relevance of the various drafting uh, procedures that can be adopted in the document itself. So, starting uh, at the beginning, Novation is a tripartite agreement, i.e. three parties, uh, where the benefits and the burdens of a contract are transferred. So in this example that we see here, an employer might have engaged a consultant and a contractor, and then via the novation agreement, the consultant uh, becomes engaged by the contractor. So that is the basic premise uh, of novation and how it works as set out there with the visual aid. So um, it's worth noting the difference between novation and assignment. Of course, assignment. Uh, transfers the rights of a contract, um, but novation transfers uh, the obligations there as well. Um, an assignment generally doesn't require or doesn't require the consent of the parties to take place uh, unless the contract provides uh, for that requirement, uh, whereas a novation um, always would require the consent. There are a couple of exceptions that we'll come on to later in terms of conduct um, but we'll, we'll touch on those um, when we get to them later. So what actually happens then uh, when a novation occurs? Uh, well, there is a rescission of one contract and the substitution of a fresh contract uh, where the original contractual obligations uh, are carried out by different parties. Um, of course, in construction contracts, um, this process normally refers to the means by which uh, design consultants are initially contracted to a client uh, and then novated to the contractor. Um, in terms of the uh, tension between novation and assignment, uh, it's worth uh, just considering this 
in the context of step-in rights. Um, this is potentially problematic if you're looking to just assign um, in the sense that um, there is not just a benefit with step-in rights, there will also be um, some obligations, there'll be a burden as part of them too. Uh, so there is therefore an argument that at least um, strictly speaking, um, collateral warranties, for instance, ought to be uh, novated rather than assigned. But that's, um, I suppose, a bit of a, an academic point, really. Of course, um, novation in construction, uh, this is a sort of design and build scenario, which uh, is to be contrasted, of course, with the um, traditional procurement method. So as I briefly touched on uh, just now, um, in design and build projects, the design team is commonly appointed by a client to carry out the initial studies or to prepare a concept or detailed design. Uh, and then when a contractor is appointed to carry out or complete this design uh, and of course construct those works, the design team um, or sometimes part of it is novated to work uh, for them. Um, now, why do clients like this? Well, uh, it's beneficial um, as continuity is maintained from pre-tender to post-tender, uh, whilst hopefully, and we'll come on to why uh, this sometimes isn't the case, but hopefully leaving sole responsibility for designing and building the project with the contractor. Innovation, um, as we said, effectively overwrites the contractual history to give the impression that the consultant has worked for the contractor throughout the project. And there's of course a difference whether or not it's a switch or ab initio, i.e. from the beginning, uh, in terms of how that novation is taking place, but we will come on to that distinction um, shortly. So in terms of uh, what you would look for in your construction documents in relation to novation? Well, um, as we've said, novation requires consent. Um, so if uh, the novation itself and the form of the agreement uh, weren't agreed, uh, then the consultant would be under no obligation to be novated. Uh, it's therefore very important that the construction documents um, contain express terms obligating the contractor and the consultant to enter into that agreement. Uh, and ordinarily what you would have is um, the proposed form of novation agreement appended um, to the contractual documentation. Uh, this is to avoid the scenario of having an agreement to agree, which of course is not enforceable. So, in terms of the details surrounding uh, an ovation clause, uh, well, what would that look like? Well, you would look to have um, a timing in there. So when would the novation take place? Is there a trigger event? Could this be, for example, when the DMB build contract is entered into? And as I said, the form of agreement should also be appended so the parties know what it is they are agreeing to. Um, you would also look to have a time period specified for signature and return of the agreement. Um, perhaps um, the consultant would be required to do so in 14 days. That would be um, a receipt of document. That would be a common enough time frame. Uh, and as well, you would look for some specificity as to who the third party to the novation might be. So is it going to be restricted to a replacement developer, uh, design and build contractor, or another relevant individual with specific qualifications that would be set out uh, in the document? You may uh, also, of course, this is not necessarily recommended, but this does sometimes happen, and therefore it's worth um, just touching on and looking out for. Uh, you could have a simple novation clause. So something along the lines of the developer may transfer the benefit and burden of this appointment at any time to a funder without the consent of the professional consultant. Um, and whilst this sort of fairly vague and not very robust drafting 
doesn't use the word novation. Um, it does refer to the transfer of a benefit and a burden. Um, so it's more than merely an assignment based on the distinction that we've discussed a bit earlier. Um, as, as I said, this best practice is probably not to simply include a bare right to novate, um, and any clause uh, dealing with this ought to go into the detail um, which I've just described. Uh, in doing so, you will be able to avoid potential pitfalls of novation, which we will discuss shortly uh, in relation to um, a case actually involving Carillion. But we'll come on to that uh, shortly, as I've said. So, um, as I've mentioned there in terms of what we'd look for, uh, it is important that any of the innovation documentation is properly drawn up uh, and clearly specifies the services which the consultants perform for the client and those which they will now perform for the contractor. Uh, of course, if this distinction isn't clearly made, uh, then any initial appointments uh, may be rendered meaningless. Uh, of course, uh, the example cited here, a requirement for the consultant to inspect the contractor's work and report to the client um, needs to be adequately dealt with because, of course, um, they would be now appointed by the contractor. So it's important that as part of that process, um, the services are adequately dealt with. So, um, as we say here, the process of novation can leave designers feeling potentially as though they've got mixed loyalties, um, particularly where there's a liability for any design work carried out prior to novation. Uh, and if the contractor does not take on the design team uh, as if they had been employed from the beginning, um, it would be very prudent for them to obtain warranties for any of those pre-novation services. So this is the distinction between um, an ab initio, i.e. taking on from the beginning, um, or a switch whereby the um, consultant is simply shunted over uh, to the contractor um, halfway through their services. And it's um, the latter of those two examples that um, was the subject of the dispute uh, in Blythe and Blythe uh, and Carillion, which is um, a sanitary lesson uh, on what not to do, frankly, in uh, novations. So what happened in that case? Well, let's take a closer look um, and see what went wrong. Um, this just the, the consultant switch that I mentioned, uh, where the original agreement between the consultants and the client terminates on appointment, uh, resulting in a new agreement. Um, but of course, there could be a pre-novation liability. Uh, and this is the, the scenario in Blythe and Blythe uh, and Carillion. So what happened? Well, the basic facts are these. The employer THI Leisure appointed Blythe and Blythe as engineers. Um, um, uh, pursuant to this appointment, Blythe and Blythe prepared the technical information for the tenders. Uh, which obviously used to engage the building contractor, and they chronically underestimated the amount of steel reinforcement required in the works. This underestimated figure was included in the bills in the building contractor's tender, and then ended up being, unfortunately, incorporated into the building contract, and this was between THI Leisure and Carillion. Under their professional appointment to THI, Blythe and Blythe had to enter into a novation agreement with Carillion. So far, so good. Um, the, as we've said, there were inaccuracies um, and deficiencies in the pre-tender information which they had prepared now, Carillion relied on this information uh, in tendering for the job. And of course, um, it then transpired that due to the underestimation, there was going to be a substantial additional cost for Carillion. 
So what ended up happening? Well, um, Carillion, of course, claimed that Blythe and Blythe had breached their contractual duties, which they owed to the employer, THI, under the deed of appointment. Um, but of course, these occurred before the date of the agreement. Um, these were pre-novation breaches. Uh, and the issue here is that the novation agreement was a switch, uh, as we uh, described, and not ab initio, i.e. Um, it didn't deal with the entire contractual relationship, it just changed at the date of the novation agreement. Now, um, you can probably guess what happened next. Uh, and that was that the court said, well, Carillion, you don't have the right to recover these losses um, because the breach occurred prior to the novation. And at that point, it was a duty that Blythe and Blythe owed to THI and not you. Uh, and sort of clarifying that decision, the court said, well, um, because Carillion had been engaged on a fixed price contract, and because THI had suffered no loss, um, Carillion then couldn't claim against them. It would have been different if THI had also suffered a loss. So it was a rather unfortunate scenario where they had to eat up those additional costs. Um, in slightly more detail then, uh, the courts held that on a proper construction of the novation agreement, the contractor could not claim for its own losses caused by breaches by the engineer prior to the date of novation in relation to those duties uh, owed to the employer prior to the novation. Uh, further, that those losses weren't losses conceived as having been suffered by the employer, as we said, they didn't have to pay any more money themselves, so there wasn't a loss there. Uh, and novation doesn't retrospectively change those obligations that have already been performed. So um, parties, and in particular in this instance, contractors, need to um, be vigilant um, and ensure that the documents are appropriately drafted to protect their interests. And of course, one of the ways um, around this is to obtain collateral warranties, uh, which in the event of a switch in novation would protect the parties from those pre-novation losses, um, if any. So an interesting case. Um, this is one half of the two schools of thought on novation. Um, this is the so-called um, black hole scenario. Uh, where there is a gap there in, in relation to pre-novation uh, losses, uh, where it's a, a switch novation. Um, there are other commentators that say, um, as a matter of common sense, that shouldn't be the case. But nonetheless, it is important as a case to consider and be aware of uh, when looking at the potential dangers um, of novation. As I said before, um, novation is a fairly innocuous subject, um, but of course um, is vitally important, you know, as one of the key tenets of contracting um, and building in, in the industry. So it's vitally important that um, it's done properly and with all care, with all due care and attention. So did innovation take place? Um, sometimes the courts will have to assess whether or not they think innovation took place. And this is one such example. It's the case of Camel and Denny Architects and Adelaide Jones and Company. Uh, and just by way of background, February 2008, the architect was retained by Adelaide Jones, the employer, to provide architectural services in relation to the renovation and refit of building in Mayfair. These services included the feasibility, design, tender and construction phases of the project, but didn't include contract administration or project management. 
the fee was set at £425,000 plus that. So the contract, uh, in terms of how that was evidenced, well, that was evidenced by two letters, uh, and they expressly incorporated the REVA standard form of agreement for the appointment of an architect, and that agreement um, contains an adjudication clause. Incidentally, um, on that form of document, wonderful if you're an architect, less wonderful if you're anyone else, um, uh, but just something to look out for there. Um, it's not great in its standard form uh, unless you're an architect, but I just leave that little thought uh, with you. So what happened? The parties held discussions and exchanged correspondence between the months of July and September, looking into possible innovation from the employer to another company. The employer also considered extending the services to include this contract administration and management, and the architect proposed a revised fee. On the 12th of September, uh, at a meeting between the parties, sadly, they couldn't reach a new agreement. And you can guess uh, what's coming. Um, the employer in February sought to terminate um, the architect's employment. The architect sought to recover its fees amounting to some £130,000 and issued a notice of adjudication in April. Uh, the employer challenged the adjudicator's jurisdiction, um, which of course uh, is uh, one method of trying to render unenforceable uh, a decision, uh, arguing that an ovation took place in August and that the employer was not the correct party to the adjudication, uh, instead suggesting that the architect should um, leave off these, this action and pursue Euro constructions. Uh, the employer then very sensibly reserved its right to challenge the adjudicator's jurisdiction in any subsequent enforcement proceedings, which would be a diligent thing to do, of course. Um, the adjudicator wasn't having that though, and said that they disagreed with the employer in terms of the innovation arguments and made an award uh, in favour of the architect. Uh, the employer didn't comply with the decision and the architect had no option but to commence enforcement proceedings. In these proceedings, the employer maintained again that there was no jurisdiction because of the novation to Euro constructions. Uh, the judge, similarly minded um, as, the, uh, as the adjudicator, rejected these arguments and enforced the decision by way of summary judgment. Um, and there will be cost consequences of that uh, as well. So the court said um, clearly there wasn't sufficient agreement that was demonstrable. Uh, between the parties um, that would suggest that an ovation agreement um, has taken place. Uh, however, let's look at some examples now of where an ovation can be implied. Now, um, again, worth um, being aware of these. So let's take a closer look. So, Chatsworth Investments and Cousins Contractors Limited. So the claimants engaged a building firm to undertake the erection of the building, and the building firm in turn, uh, as um, is fairly ordinary practice, uh, arranged for part of the work to be undertaken by subcontractors. The building was completed in 1962, and in 1963, the building firm assigned its assets to the defendants, who was a subcontractor, who undertook, and this is the important part, to discharge all the firm's liabilities. The defendants then assumed the original name of the building firm. Now already, I'm sure you can see the potential difficulties here and the confusion um, that can arise in these scenarios where you agree to take on uh, the, and discharge the liabilities of a different company 
and you change your name to their name. So what's happened, what went wrong, and what did the courts think and find? So in August, the claimants issued a writ, as you would back then, claiming damages for defects which had appeared in the building. The defendants received this and then went on to say that they were not party to the original contract, i.e. it's not me, Gov, you've got the wrong guy. So then the claimants applied to amend their statement of claim to allege that there was an ovation agreement to be implied whereby the defendants made a new contract with the claimants to take over the liabilities of the original building firm, which they would have to do, um, otherwise uh, you wouldn't have privacy of contract, i.e. Um, a clear link between um, claimant and defendant, um, pursuant to which an action can be brought. So what do we think happened? Well. The defendant said, we are not the people with whom you contracted in 1960, which seems reasonable enough on the face of it, although we bear the sole same name, having changed their name afterwards. We are a different company. We did not take over until 1963. We took an assignment of the assets and we agreed to discharge the liabilities, but we did not make that contract with you. Now, to make a concession on those lines is a bit foolish in my mind, because by saying discharging the liabilities and admitting that you took an assignment of assets, well, what are the fundamental tenets of an ovation, the transfer, as we mentioned at the start, of benefits and burdens or obligations? So you can see where this is going, can't you? Based on that admission, it should be fairly clear what the courts decided. So Lord Denning, the inimitable Lord Denning, uh, said as follows. On the face of it, that looked like a complete defence. They were not the contracting party. That was their position. To overcome that difficulty, the plaintiffs applied for leave to amend their claim. They wished to allege that there was an ovation whereby the second company if I may call it so, Cousins Contractors Limited number two, made a new agreement with them to take over and be responsible to the plaintiffs for the liability of Cousins Contractors number one. They said that this innovation was to be implied from all the circumstances of the case. The defendants objected to the proposed amendment. They said that the alleged innovation was too tenuous. Uh, you want to lose on your on the arguments like that and was wanting in particularity. There is nothing in this objection. It would be very easy to infer an ovation from the circumstances of this case. I think that makes complete sense because you have the admission saying that we weren't the contracting party, and I think that's accepted, but also that we received the assets of that party, and then that we agreed to discharge their liabilities. Ergo, an ovation must have taken place on that basis. So, um, although that case is from 1969, um, the findings were echoed by Justice Coulson, uh, in Enterprise Managed Services and McFadden Utilities. Again, so the courts haven't abandoned that, that overall position and that, that opinion. So we can see from a lot of those cases that agreement would be required, but also in, in these cases that um, it's possible for an innovation agreement to be implied based on the circumstances. So some more case law now, just to look at the different assets, of, assets, aspects of innovation and what the courts have found in relation to those. So innovation of part, this is Langston Group Corporation and Cardiff City, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, 
Cardiff City Football Club. So the High Court considered a variation to a contract between A and B, whereby A and B agreed that C would perform some of B's obligations. Justice Briggs stated, although the variation agreement did not use the word novation and did not describe itself as such, clearly there was a substitution and the variation agreement was in fact a novation agreement. This is because um, the rights and obligations were being substituted. So a variation agreement that substituted one party for another for only some of the obligations under an existing contract did not automatically take effect by extinguishing the whole of the original contract and replacing it with another, i.e. some of the rights and obligations were transferred and substituted and some of them remained. And this was a very rare case where the whole contract was not extinguished and a whole new contract on those terms was not made, merely a, a separate contract for those substituted rights and obligations. So innovation over part is possible um, in rare circumstances, just worth um, being aware of that. Now, we're going to talk about uh, the case of Gallifrey Try and Mott McDonald now. Um, there is a visual aid coming up, and um, I apologise because it, this one's a bit fiddly. And frankly, at 9.30, it's quite early in the morning for fiddly um, legal cases. But bear with me, and we will get to the visual aid as promised. But um, as I said, prior warning on this one, as it um, isn't the simplest of structures. So what happened in this case? <clears throat> well, Gallifrey Tri were retained by development company. Well, we'll call Gallifrey Tri G, we'll call this company S. Um, they were the design and build contractor of a hospital in Birmingham. Uh, Mont McDonald M had been retained by wholly owned subsidiary of S, which we shall call L to provide structural and engineering services, including major elements of the design of that project. So in the period leading up to Gallifrey Tri being retained, Gallifrey Tri and Mont McDonald had begun to liaise directly. Shortly before they were retained, they employed a subcontractor, who we shall call R, you can see where this is going, can't you? I did say it was a bit fiddly to carry out and take over responsibility for the steelwork in place of M. So these took place, these discussions took place rather, some negotiations uh, in relation to novating uh, M's contract with S to G uh, upon G being retained. Uh, but unfortunately, no agreement to novation uh, took place. And the project ended up completing a bit later than anticipated. So there's a claim brewing, basically. So Gallifrey Tri tried to recover their losses from Lock McDonald, but the court found that the novation hadn't taken place. Without an effective novation agreement between those uh, three parties, Gallifrey Tri, Lock McDonald, and the subcontractor, Gallifrey Tri did not have a contract with Lock McDonald, i.e. there was no basis for the claim that they were making. Um, in, uh, uh, in, in contract. So they had to try and bring a claim in tort and they were not successful in doing so. And this case highlights the fact that even if a party planned, wanted to, and almost relied upon the fact that they had <coughs> sorry, <excuse> me, <coughs> enacted the novation, this will not be sufficient to rely upon it. There must be a clear agreement between the parties. <clears throat> um, oh, where's the? Well, hopefully that slide is coming up. Yes. Oh. Um, it's, it's, it's disappeared. Let me see if I can. Um, no. Okay. Uh, well, apologies for that. I think it's ended up um, being hidden. The explanatory slide um, for this. But anyone that wants to see the structure of that. 
claim and the various um, contractual links and why, in fact, uh, it didn't um, end up uh, going in Gallifrey Tri's favour, um, let us know and I can send that round. Plus, if you need the slides as well, it'll be in that copy. So apologies for that, but it is explained there in detail. <clears throat> so repudiatory breach in novation. Um, repudiatory breach, of course, is a breach of contract so serious as to go to the root of the contract. Um, and um, let's have a look at this in the context of novation. Um, this is a rather outrageous case of Quest Advisors uh, and McFreely. So here it was argued that an attempt to transfer contractual obligations without first seeking the other party's consent is a repudiatory breach of contract. <clears throat> That's perhaps not surprising in that you're effectively trying to intermeddle with um, the contractual um, framework. Um, without seeking consent. Um, what did the court say? Well, the court said that on the facts, the purported transfer had not demonstrated an intention on the part of the would-be transferor to reject the contract and its obligations under it. Um, instead, it had taken the honest but wrong belief that the transferee was liable to perform the relevant obligations in its place. <clears throat> So there was a degree of understanding there from the part of the court, but it certainly would be a repudiatory breach of contract were you seeking to novate people, um, come what may, and without their participation or consent. So to clarify that, the court said, um, as there was no reason to suppose the would-be transferor would refuse to perform its obligations, um, they remained bound by the agreement uh, and no repudiation had been established. This is the honest but mistaken belief. The court, though, went on to say, in other circumstances, um, for instance, following a final decision in proceedings, if the would-be transferor persisted in arguing that its obligations had been transferred, the would-be transferor's actions might be capable of amounting to repudiatory conduct. Um, so by analogy, it would appear that serving a notice of novation in an attempt to gain consent will not of itself constitute a repudiatory breach, although if the continuing party withholds consent, uh, continuing to act as though it had taken place, uh, would be basically get the party's consent is the, is the bottom line here. Don't try and pull a fast one. Um, that is the message. So, um, in terms of novation in the context of dispute uh, resolution, uh, well, the case of Young Road Limited and Costane uh, from uh, 2001 uh, is the authority that novation agreements can be construction contracts. Now, um, that uh, case itself was um, potentially unusual in that the novation agreement actually related to a subcontract, but it's nonetheless uh, an authority and of course will depend uh, on the specific drafting of your novation agreements as well. Uh, so in terms of avoiding disputes, um, if you are going to end up in a dispute, clearly you, you can adjudicate, but what um, should you look for? Um, and what should you be doing? Well, um, if, say, a developer wants to novate the appointment of a professional consultant, um, clearly it's a good idea to get this, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, agreed as soon as possible. Um, the agreement itself ought to uh, record the novation and nothing else. Um, so, we would say that you probably shouldn't have warranties back to the developer in that agreement. Um, those should be dealt with separately for the same clarity. And the terms and the scope of any services should be consistent with novation uh, and 
should expressly be catered for. So what I mean by that is um, the innovation should be in relation to actual services, um, professional services, say design, um, contract administration, et cetera, et cetera, rather than simply administrative, cooperative, or monitoring um, obligations. Clearly those would not need to necessarily be innovated. So what then would be the key clauses in relation to potential disputes arising? Um, <clears throat> well, how is any liability dealt with? Um, clearly, depending on who you are, whether you're the contractor, whether you're the consultant, whether you're the developer or special employer, this is, is going to be looked at slightly differently. Um, but the sort of clause that you might see uh, would be uh, one along the lines of the contractor shall not be prevented from recovering any losses incurred by the contractor that result from a breach under this clause um, because of acts or omissions causing the breach occurring before the deed and that picks up the um, blinding, blinding brilliant point or that the employer will not incur, has not incurred and would not have incurred. So again that shores up that distinction earlier um, between things, uh, pre-innovation breaches and losses which you would seek to recover um, but which the original party didn't and wouldn't have suffered. So if you have that clause in there, that will enable a contractor um, to recover those additional losses. Uh, what other sort of key clauses are often grounds for dispute? Uh, well, a clause stating that all sums have been paid by the employer slash developer. Um, is there a release clause in there as well? Um, these are things to look out for. Clearly, um, if all sums haven't been settled, um, then having a clause in there that says they have will pose difficulties. Um, the other thing to look out for is, is there any variation of the terms of the appointment, save to make it make sense? Again, uh, what is the agreement looking to do? Does that novation agreement seek to make any material changes to the appointment? Uh, and also, of course, we would say, um, check any third party rights clauses. Do those, do, do they interface properly with any separate warranties uh, as well? So those would be the areas to look out for and to ensure you, you've got those down to avoid any other issues. But of course, adjudication uh, the quick solution in those cases. So um, that's pretty much that. Uh, if you have any questions, um, put them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, thank you, Lachlan. We do indeed have some questions. Um, and just to clarify, uh, the slide deck that everyone has downloaded from the email link does contain that missing slide. Um, which does more clearly demonstrate uh, what Lachlan was, was talking to you about earlier, about the, the uh, relationship between all of those. Mm. Now, in terms of questions, we have the following questions for you, Lachlan. A couple okay. of these pre-submitted. Are Switch and Abnicio Innovation almost indistinguishable when employers request warranties back once a Switch or Novation has occurred? Uh, the simple answer to that is uh, effectively yes. Um, if you've got those warranties there, then you will be able to rely upon them and the effect would be the same uh, if you had uh, obligations uh, being transferred right from the beginning uh, as you would with a switch with the warranties. So um, good practice certainly and the answer to that is pretty much yes. Okay, <clears throat> how relevant is innovation to the COVID-19 disruption? Um, can it be a better procurement route? Uh, well, I think it's relevant um, to the extent that, of course, the uh, COVID-19 disruption is affecting contracts across the board. Um, do I think um, it's a, a more effective procurement route? Well, certainly it, it represents a, a, you know, a means of um, parties um, transferring their, their rights and obligations. So it, clearly it can be of assistance. I think um, perhaps we'll have to see, uh, time will tell the, the relevance and the extent of 
of any novations that, that do occur in this time. But I think um, you know, it, it's a useful tool for parties, um, but clearly there's huge disruption caused by COVID-19, um, which we're all battling through. Okay, um, another question for you. Would a contractor be able to renegotiate the terms of the novation, e.g. the cost, with design consultants sort of being novated? Um, yeah, certainly. Parties are able to um, amend agreements. Uh, again, you would have to have consent to do this, but you would do that by way of a deed of variation. So yes, it, it is certainly feasible, um, but of course, um, we would say get the lawyers involved um, and make sure that it's done properly. So uh, yeah, give us a call. <laughs> okay. Um, is the client liable to pay to pay additional monies if the novation terms and fees negotiated at pretender is found to be insufficient once the contractor takes on the novated consultants? Is the contractor bound to pay? Is the client liable to pay additional oh, right. monies if the novation terms and fees? Um, you well as part of the um, novation agreement you'd ordinarily have a client release clause uh, so uh, the result of that being that the contractor then became liable effectively so um, that would be ordinary practice of course it depends exactly what form of novation agreement that you have and how it's been drafted, but you would expect the client to have had a release clause in there, effectively absolving them of further liability. Okay, um, and the final question that's been submitted today is, what are the employer's rights in the event of a breach of contract or subcontract by the main contractor? Well, it depends on what the contract itself is. Um, it, 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 whoever submitted that question, is, do, you, do you want to be any more specific? Because clearly you would, you would look to the contract for um, what the rights and obligations are and then for uh, the dispute resolution procedure and or um, notification procedures w within the contracts, or whatever it might be. I mean, just saying a breach of contract, well, you, you would look at your remedies um, and rights and you would seek to exercise them but without um, uh, any more specificity um, I can't go into any more detail. Okay, um, another question just come in. Okay. Is it wise to include an ovation appendix in every subcontract order as standard? This is drafted by the, con the contractor um, as a template infilling the party names. Um, well, if there is ever going to be a need um, to novate, then um, it would be very good practice to, to include that agreement um, with your documents. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, um, given that it is going to require consent, uh, it's much easier to say that you've got consent when a party has signed up to a, a contract that appends a form of novation agreement. That way you can say, well, you've seen it, you've agreed to it, and all that really needs changing um, is putting in the party names and the date extension. So yes, very good practice to include a novation agreement um, with your with your with your uh, contract. Um, that way you can show that it's been agreed. Uh, um, and yes, append it as a specimen document at the back. Okay, that's great. Well, that seems to be the end of the questions for today. So thank you very everyone for attending and thank you very much, Lachlan, for um, sharing your expertise with us. My pleasure. As always, if anyone has any more specific issues or um, something they'd like to talk to you about, your contact details are on the website and on the slide deck. Please feel free, everyone, to contact Lachlan. He will happily discuss these with you. Um, we have more June dates up on the website to book seminars. Please have a look at those. The CPD will be out uh, in the next 24 hours and we look forward to seeing you virtually again soon. Please stay safe everyone. Thanks and goodbye.